Hi, I'm James Dickey, Senior Trial Counsel for the Upper Midwest Law Center. Welcome back to Minnesota Law Weekly, our weekly podcast where we talk about all things legal in Minnesota and the cases that UMLC is bringing in the courts. Joining me, joining me here today is John Hinderocker, President of the Center of the American Experiment. John, welcome to the podcast. Great to be with you, James. Thanks. Thanks for being here again. And uh, we have some very interesting discussions going on today because we're talking about all sorts of things going on across Minnesota on the legal landscape, at the legislature, and elsewhere. And so, John, but before we get into that, I, I want to give our viewers and our listeners who probably already know a lot about Center of the American Experiment, but for those who are not familiar, how about just a short explanation of what it is that CAE is focusing on and what are the priorities that CAE has for Minnesotans today? Well, American Experiment, of course, is Minnesota's think tank. We are the conservative policy organization in Minnesota. We cover the whole range of issues that are evergreen in state and local government. We've got a number of policy fellows. We write papers and so on. What's different about us, really, compared to a lot of policy organizations is that we're very activist oriented. We saw that with the Freedom Rally, which you were at, James, day before yesterday at the Minnesota Capitol. We can maybe talk about that. Uh, but what we're focused on more than anything right now, probably, is what's happening uh, in the legislature. And, and we're fighting for good policy, and we're fighting against bad legislation, of which, goodness knows, we're seeing plenty. And, you know, when things actually do get past the legislature, once they've already been passed and the, the, the horses out of the barn, you know, then that's where UMLC will jump in and we'll bring a lawsuit if we have to in order to make uh, the government actually obey the Constitution, as it were. Um, but what's, what's, what seems like it's most interesting to me about what you just said is that CAE has this activist view and this policy-facing view on what's actually going on before it becomes law. So what are some examples of what CAE has done in terms of lending its voice to the legislature and educating folks at the legislature as to what is, is going into these bills? Well, as you know, James, we have a tough landscape for conservatives in this year's legislature. A good example is our work on the blackout bill. This is this crazy, crazy green energy bill to make all of our electricity come from wind and solar by 2040. It can't be done. Right. At any price, it can't be done. But our people have costed it out. We've got the top energy group in the country. We estimate the cost of trying to do it at $313 billion, <laughs> and you still don't have reliable e electricity. You still get blackouts. So we wrote a big report about it. Nobody's tried to take issue with our analysis, and we dubbed it the blackout bill. Right. Pretty soon, everybody in St. Paul is calling it the blackout bill. And even some news media outlets are calling it, in quotation marks, the blackout bill. Well, if the, if the phrase fits, right? The phrase fits. We got 37,000 emails sent wow. from our web page to Governor Walls and to legislators. And using zip code, our software will automatically send it to your rep and your senator. Wow. And so it's very, very effective. And and nevertheless, despite that effort, the, the blackout bill passed. Right. But it passed in the Senate by only 34-33, by right. one vote. Every Democrat voted for it, but importantly, every Republican voted against it. True. I don't think that would have happened. I, I think it unfortunately could have been a bipartisan bill if, we'd had, if we hadn't had 37,000 emails on top of a report uh, showing what a disaster this bill was going to be. And so the Republicans in the legislature proposed a series of amendments where if electricity prices rise by, you know, 50 percent, there's an off-ramp. The, mm -hmm. the mandates right. get suspended, uh, voted down, 34-33. If the blackouts start to happen, you know, then there's an off-ramp, voted down, 34-33. So we know that electricity prices are rising, have risen, are going to rise stratospherically as a result right. of this legislation, and we're going to know who to hold accountable. Right. And we also know that the day is going to come when you flip the light switch and the lights don't go on. And when that day happens, everybody is going to know who is responsible for the mess that has been created? So that's an example of, of a lot of activity in yeah, St. Paul. And, and, and we can't say it was a victory. We no. didn't stop the bill. But we did lay the groundwork for the accountability that is down the road. Right. And it's important for folks to understand that, that the legislators who you're providing information about providing information too, they are educated because of your efforts as to what these bills will do. Some of these amendments you're just talking about, uh, you know, from a consumer's perspective, I think it's a very bipartisan issue that you want the lights to be able to go on. It and you don't be. Right. And you don't want your cost of living to go up so much that you can't afford it. Uh, and so it seems like a very common sense bipartisan uh, analysis that you all were doing. And, you know, unfortunately, the legislature didn't see it the same way. 
Um, but you know, it's certainly important to have that voice in the Capitol. So we appreciate that for, on our on our end too. And there's a lot of issues that are still in play. I mean, you got taxes. The the, the uh, proposals, the budget proposals that are now in the legislature, include a number of tax uh, increases. And we have polled. We, we asked right. Minnesotans, what do you think about Yeah, you do a lot of polling. Yeah, we, we, we poll quarterly with our magazine, mm -hmm. Thinking Minnesota. And I think we got a press release out this afternoon with some of these results, specifically as to the tax proposals that are part of the Democrats' uh, legislative packages. And they're very unpopular. I mean, right. one of them, we have a campaign, Don't Jack the Tax, yes. right? We yes, have the radio ads. This. We've got the social media. What we're talking about there is they're talking about increasing car license fees oh, right. by taxing you on the basis of 160% of your car's value. Now, how that is fair, <laughs> you know, nobody can explain. Well, we polled that 81% of Minnesotans say no, you right. know, don't increase car license fees. They want to tax deliveries. They want right. to tax whether it's Amazon, Federal Express, or pizza, you know, oh, or DoorDash. They want to impose a tax on deliveries to your house. 73% of Minnesotans say, no, don't do that. So there's a number of issues. Uh, the, the legislature is adjourned now, basically right. following the first half of the session for the Easter recess. Then they're going to come back. Then we'll have the second half of the session. There's a number of issues that are still in play, where we don't know what the votes are going to be, where it's important for Minnesotans to make themselves heard. And, and speaking about Minnesotans letting their voices be heard, CAE just, just hosted a uh, Stop the Madness rally at the Capitol this last Tuesday. Why don't you talk a little bit about what led to that and, and how it went? Yeah, the Freedom Rally with the tagline, uh, Stop the Madness. Well, really the genesis of it is that we kept hearing from people around the state of Minnesota who were saying, you know, we've, we've emailed our legislators, we've written letters to the editor, whatever, but we feel like we need to do more. We feel like our voices are not being heard. And so we thought, well, let's put on a rally in the rotunda at the state capitol. Let's get a big crowd. And let's, let's make some noise and let's have some speakers and let's give people an opportunity to really make their voices heard and tell the legislators how they feel about what's been going on and what's been proposed. So we did that. And as you know, James, because you were there, it was I a was. great, great rally. Um, we had a big turnout. We had the rotunda absolutely packed with people, a lot of homemade signs, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of noise. I got to MC the rally. It was really <laughs> fun, leading cheers and chants and so on. And we had eight speakers, two policy fellows from American Experiment. We had the House minority and Senate minority leaders mm -hmm. uh, there. We had the leaders of several other conservative organizations, the Gun Group, the Minnesota Family Council, right. and so forth. And I thought all of our speakers did a terrific job. And you could feel the enthusiasm of it the was, crowd. It was palpable, that's for sure. It, it really was a lot of was. fun to be there. And we had a lot of people watching the, the live stream and, and watching the video after the fact. And I think we really did achieve the goal of, of providing an outlet for people to really feel like they are making their voices heard. Absolutely. And, you know, it is hard to find that when you feel like if you're if you are a conservative minded person and you see the trifecta is owned by the party you didn't vote for, when you, as you said, people come to you and they say, well, you know, we've written my letters to the editor, we've written everything we can, we've talked our, our, our representatives' ears off and they're not listening and all they're doing is passing bills that are opposed by 70% of Minnesotans. There really is not much else you can do at that point. But we can't lie down and die, no. James, and you know that as well as I do. You know, we gotta fight, we gotta lay the foundation right. to fight again in the next cycle and the cycle after that. But you know, the, the die has not, is, is, being, is still being cast on some of these issues. I'll just give you one example. Tim Walls was talking to reporters the other day, and he went off on this, this um, screed against Senate Republicans who don't want to vote for his gun control bill. And he's talking about how he needs 34 votes to pass it. And these Republicans, they better vote for it, or they're, they're, they're going to really be in trouble in the next election. Why is he doing that? Why, why is question. he excoriating Republicans? He's got 34 Democrats in the Senate, right? right well. Right. Obviously, the reason why he's doing that is because he doesn't have 34 votes. There are some Senate Democrats right. who have not signed uh, signed on, haven't drunk the Kool-Aid, uh, are not uh, indicating that they're willing to vote for that bill. Right, right. And there's other bills like that. I'm not so sure there's 34 Democrats who are going to vote to raise car license fees. In fact, I'll make you a little 50-cent bet <laughs> that there aren't, right? 
And other I things, hope you're right. I don't want to bet against it. And other things as well. So, you know, I think it's really important now is when the legislature comes back for the second half of the session, we've got to keep pounding away and we've right. got to let them know what Minnesotans think about some of these proposals. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, you know, one of the things I you mentioned, the gun bill, um, I've, I've read the gun bill, uh, the entirety of it. And I look through it, and one of the things that strikes me is right off the bat, they go into this, this long paragraph about how, how this is constitutional and how this is consistent with the Second Amendment. And I, I've read the whole bill, and i got to say that I disagree with that uh, quite a bit. So from the Upper Midwest Law Center perspective, you know, we are certainly scrutinizing that bill, among others. And the reality is that, you know, is, is it constitutional to prevent someone from having a magazine, a gun mag, a, a ammunition magazine that has uh, no more than 10 rounds? Is it constitutional to require someone to get advance permission from whatever uh, government, local government, in order to go on their property or else face a potential uh, cr criminal offense? And I think that these are really difficult questions for the author of the bill and for others who are uh, supporting the bill to, to grapple with. And you're right, the die is not yet cast on that. Well, one of the things going on here, James, is liberals do not take the Second Amendment seriously. They, they think that the Bill of Rights has got nine amendments not to. They don't take the other nine all that seriously either, <laughs> but they really don't believe at all in the Second Amendment. But as you know, the federal courts take yes. a very different view. And just last week, we had a decision on, on the law that discriminated in effect against 18, 19, and 20-year-old adults. That's right was held to be unconstitutional. So there are some very serious legal issues that will be raised if this bill, in fact, does pass. That's right. Exactly right. And and so the legislature is certainly, a, you know, a tempest in and of itself. But there's also a lot more going on in Minnesota that American Experiment has been very involved in standing up against. And I think back to uh, last year and the year before and the Raise Our Standards tour that Center of the American Experiment put on, going specifically into detail and talking about what the changes to the social study standards in Minnesota might look like um, if the uh, uh, Department of Education makes these radical changes that they have actually proposed. Um, and in fact, I, I think the American Experiment also, as part of its excellent policy advocacy, uh, put out a report from an expert who I think it was Wilfred McClay, it said, yeah. look, uh, this is not even close to being good. <laughs> this, is, this turns Minnesota from maybe the best state in the nation in terms of social study standards to the worst in the nation. And, and I, you know, looking at these, it's hard to imagine how having kindergartners learn about being a social justice warrior has any place in our school system. But maybe you can comment well, about CAE's efforts on this issue. Maybe teach them to read. You know, <laughs> we, we live in a state where only 36% of Oof. 11th graders can do math at, at grade level. Oh, man. And grade level is nothing to write home about either. Right. I mean, our schools are a disaster. And instead of trying to make them better, the liberals are, are trying to turn them even more in the direction of indoctrination, not education. So critical race theory is what drove the social studies standards. They've been held in abeyance for the time being. Critical race theory is now rearing its head again mm -hmm. in the form of this ethnic studies legislation sure. that is being proposed. And, and when you talk to people about ethnic studies, most people say, oh, ethnic studies, that means learning about the customs and cultures of foreign countries, you know, like, like Norway and Spain and Poland and Brazil. No, no, that has right. nothing to do with what's actually in this bill. This bill is just another attempt to get critical race theory in the door to tell elementary school kids that they're either oppressors or victims, one or the other, to tell minority kids, you may as well give up. You don't have a chance in life. We've got white supremacy here, and you, you're, you have no prospects in life. I can't imagine, I can't imagine who thinks that that's a good idea or a fair thing to do to those poor kids, but that's exactly what they're trying to do. So if you go to our website, we've got the bait and switch page. Right, right. And, and it's opposing. We're getting thousands of people to send emails opposing this terrible, terrible legislation. And one of the things we do on this page is we quote what the proponents of this bill are saying about it. That's the bait. That's important. And then we literally quote what the bill says, and that's the switch. And you can't believe some of the things that this bill actually says it is critical race theory right down the line and they're trying to impose it on all of the school kids in Minnesota's public schools. So that is a battle we're fighting right now and we'll see. We'll see if they've got the votes to, to, to pass that terrible, terrible bill. And you know, it, on that front, I mean, one of the things that I don't think a lot of folks really know about is that Minnesota on the books and the statutes already has 
a law that requires cultural competency for teachers, right, to, to be able to understand their pupils and understand different people and to be able to work with people of different backgrounds in order to be an effective teacher. But this is a whole different thing. This goes far beyond cultural competency, as it has been traditionally called. And I, former Representative Sandra Erickson talked a lot about that uh, in her time in the House of Representatives, about how we already have uh, standards in place that are adequate to truly create a colorblind, fair, and equitable system for all people in Minnesota. And But, but the liberals don't want <laughs> colorblind. They don't want fair. They want racist, anti-American education, and that's exactly what is in this bill. Right, and that and that is the concern. And, and again, on the legal front, from the UMLC perspective, we look at this and say, you know, I, I, when, you, when you see the testimony of uh, the, the individual who testified, Kofi Monska, Coffee. a wonderful uh, person and a, uh, um, an excellent attorney in her own right, um, and, and, and she's, she's, she looks at this and says, you're telling my kids because of the color of their skin that, that they have no hope for the future. They're destined to fail. Right. It's unbelievable. So Coffee testified, limited to two minutes by, yeah. uh, by the committee <laughs> rules. Two, but it's the best two minutes you're ever going to see. And <laughs> yeah. our viewers, if you haven't seen Coffee's two minutes, you got to track it down and see That's it. Right. So, so, but this is an example of what we do. We all kind of work together here. You know? So we made a clip. You know, you, they have the stream. The committee streams sure. the testimony. So we, we found that two minutes. We clipped it. And we put it out on TikTok and Twitter and so forth, and it got picked up all over. Close to 2 million people have now watched wow. Coffee's video. That has gone national. It's gone international. And so it's just one more example of the importance right. of, of fighting against these bad ideas. You know, and I, and I note that in the Minnesota Constitution, we have a provision that requires there to be an adequate and equal public education for all students. Now, Maybe charter schools and other uh, public options other than your traditional public schools might help to advance that. But one thing is for sure is that teaching kids to be hopeless, teaching kids that the color of their skin dooms them from the start, is not providing an adequate education. So I think that there's an issue there from the Minnesota Constitution's perspective as to whether or not this bill and this type of law could be upheld in court. Well, it's an interesting point, James. And I go back to the word adequate, and I say, look, if half of our kids can't read yeah. and two-thirds of them can't do math, they are not getting an adequate education. Exactly. And we're not going to make it adequate by trying to indoctrinate them in this social justice nonsense. We've got to teach them to read and write and multiply right. and divide. And the same thing applies when you look at other executive branch actions, like with the Pelsby, the public... Uh, Professional Educator Licensing Standards Board in Minnesota, which is now changing licensing standards to require teachers to to make compelled speech, to make affirmations as to kids' gender identity, even if they're different from the biological sex. Also, um, uh, having with this new racial consciousness and reflection provision, requiring teachers essentially to become licensed to be forced to admit that America is a white supremacist nation and that Eurocentrism and white supremacy undermine all of our institutions and create bad outcomes for people of color. And it's just, it's a false doctrine. It's a false narrative. And it's also winnowing, you're narrowing down the talent pool of good teachers that are so much needed in this state. We need, need teachers who are good teachers, not teachers of a certain skin color or the way they look. So if, if these new licensing standards go into effect, the result is that to be a teacher in Minnesota, licensed either in public schools or private schools, you have got to take a loyalty oath. Right. You've got to say that you buy into this whole range of extreme left-wing Marxist ideology. And if you're not willing to at least say that you believe all that stuff, to take the loyalty oath, you can't be a teacher in Minnesota. This right. is just unbelievably destructive. It, it's, it's an unconstitutional condition on a teacher getting a license to teach in a public school in Minnesota. And it's, it's, it, to me, it's, it clearly doesn't pass the sniff test, and I think it's going to fall when it goes to court, because it will go to court. But James, let's turn the tables for a moment. Uh, let's talk about what's happening at UMLC. As you know, I'm on the board of UMLC. I do. I spent my life, 41 years, doing nothing but litigation. So it's uh, it's still close to my heart. What, what do you guys got going on now? Well, there's a lot going on. And I think, uh, as we've talked about already, some of the legislative actions are going to give us a very heavy plate for the summer and the fall upcoming. But specifically, things that have happened recently. Um, I, earlier on this podcast, we talked about a lawsuit 
against the Department of Employment and Economic Development on behalf of an independent journalist, Tony Webster, which turned out really well. Uh, our client got a, a $17,000 settlement, and they gave him all the data that he asked for in the first place. And government transparency is something near and dear to my heart, and I think should be near and dear to everyone, because that's the only way that individual Minnesotans can keep a check on their government, is by making sure that the government is turning over information so that we can actually see what they're doing. So that was a big victory. Uh, recently as well, uh, we represented several employees in appeals of denials of unemployment benefits after they were fired from their jobs because they had a religious objection to the vaccine mandates at their employers. And so far, of the five cases, we've only had two that have gone to the conclusion, and we've had victories in both. Uh, so victories in the Court of Appeals that sent our cases back and resulted in uh, unemployment benefits being paid to our clients. So those were huge, and they were really great to see these folks who really have been mistreated getting some sort of benefit, some sort of consolation, if you will, from uh, the horrible situation that they had to endure just because of what their religious beliefs are. Are we ever going to see an accounting, James? I mean, with hindsight, okay, almost all of us got vaccinated, large right. majority, I did. We all caught COVID, right? Yeah. Everybody yeah. caught COVID anyway. It didn't make any difference. And, you know, you sniffled for a couple of days, then you went back to work. Are we ever going to see an accounting for what was done, the shutdowns, the mandates? Well, we brought a lawsuit against that, and we won on behalf of the churches in Minnesota. We defeated the governor's motion to dismiss our claim, and the governor eventually entered a settlement with our clients, our church clients, who, which said that if Target's open, the church is open, if there's ever any kind of COVID shutdown again. So there's already been an accounting as it relates to religious institutions. We also brought lawsuits relate on, on behalf of individual businesses, and unfortunately, the, the, the courts were not really willing to go there with the business claims that we brought. But I do think, though, that the fact well, that... Well, you know why. Well, you go tell me. <laughs> I would love to know. Because if they had to pay damages to all the businesses that they shut down, <laughs> That's right. uh, our taxes would really be high in Minnesota. I mean, there's not enough money, you know, to, to repair the... But, you know, what that tells you is how much damage was done. Yeah, that's true. They did so much harm with those shutdowns that there's no feasible way to repay the damage. Yeah, that's right. And one of the things that I would say continually to people who ask me about our cases as they're going on is while that case related to a takings claim was alive, takings against the government, um, was, well, I have an idea. There's a $17 billion surplus, and I know where it can go. Back to the business owners who got shut down and still were forced to carry their rent for weeks on end. Months. Um, months at times. You know, that's a huge economic loss to a lot of people. And I think we all know, you look at around your favorite old restaurants and they're gone. And and the reality is that there, there have been articles recently talking about how, well, when you control for comorbidities and other factors, Minnesota was middle of the pack at best in terms of our recovery from COVID. So I think the accounting is already there. The question is whether people will pick up on the fact that our, our, our uh, the policies that took place during the pandemic were, frankly, a disaster. And the, the same goes for private businesses. So I mentioned the unemployment benefits cases that we have gotten victories on recently for individuals who have been terminated. But also, we have now brought, uh, I believe, a total of about eight lawsuits in federal court on behalf of employees who were fired against the companies themselves. And the basis for that is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which is that if you have a religious objection to an employment practice, as you know, John, you can get an exemption, an accommodation, as long as there's no undue hardship on the business. And basically, these businesses have said across the board, well, you know, we have to do anything different. There's an undue hardship. And so they, they use that as, I think, a pretext to get rid of employees uh, who had these religious objections. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court is now going to look at a case called Groff versus DeJoy, which will decide whether this de minimis exception, as it's called, is really a uh, that an employer can make up anything in order to get around having an accommodation, or if they actually have to show that there's some kind of harm to their business as a result of accommodating these employees. And I think that the Supreme Court, from having taken this case, I think they're going to have a sea change in how Title VII works. And I think our clients, the ones who have brought these lawsuits, are going to be very successful in, uh, in, in getting good results for them, even despite the, the discrimination that they suffered at the hands of their employer. Well, keep up the good work, James. <laughs> Thank it's been you. great having you on the program. Oh, yeah. Thanks, John. <laughs> thanks for letting me get on my soapbox there, John. I much appreciate it. Um, well, John, thanks so much for joining us this week. Um, we're going to call it a wrap, I think. I really appreciate the work that Center of the American Experiment is doing. Um, excellent advocacy and educational work to let 
those in Minnesota know there's a voice fighting for them in the policy realm, and also to educate le uh, legislators, like you said, folks who need to understand, you know, even in their positions of power, need education and understanding as to what these bills will actually do and what people think about these bills. So I think what CAE is doing is great, and you know, obviously from our side at UMLC, we kind of pick up the pieces after the fact when, <laughs> when the bad bills end up becoming law. Um, but in the meantime, thank you for all the work that you all do. Well, thank you, James, for having me on. I'll be glad to come back anytime. I really appreciate that, John. Well, that's it for this week on Minnesota Law Weekly. Thanks again, John, for joining us. And you can visit Center of the American Experiments website at AmericanExperiment.org, and you can make a confidential tax-deductible donation to American Experiment by clicking their Donate button. And likewise, you can make a confidential tax-deductible donation on UMLC.org to the Upper Midwest Law Center, or you can send a check to 8421 Wyzetta Boulevard, Suite 300, Golden Valley, Minnesota. We thank you for all of your contributions. We thank you for supporting us because we are 100% donor supported. And without that donor support, true grassroots support, John, as you know, at American Experiment, uh, despite uh, you know misgivings that others in the media <laughs> might have about you, we're truly grassroots, gra grassroots supported organizations and we need your support now more than ever. We are fighting back for you. American Experiment is fighting back for you. There is hope in Minnesota. There's a reason to continue to fight. There's a reason to continue to advocate on behalf of common sense, conservative interests. And so you should continue to give to American Experiment, give to Upper Midwest Law Center, help us to do this very important work that we're doing on your behalf. And we thank you in advance for it.